Hey there, and welcome to First Person, Interviews with Authors. This is a new monthly segment of Why Is This Good?, a podcast by the Naples Writers' Workshop. I am your host, Anna Karras, and I am coming to you from beautiful Naples, Florida, where the workshop has been bringing the literary community together since 2014. First Person is a podcast where we worm our way inside an author's gray matter to see what makes them tick. Along the way, we'll discover useful nuggets on the creative process, writing techniques and rituals, plus get inside information on projects on which the author is currently working. This month for me is a real treat. Eminent novelist and prolific short story writer Richard Bausch is with us. He is currently a professor in the creative writing department at Chapman University in Orange, California, but is so much more than that. He received his MFA from the Iowa Writers' Workshop, has taught at universities around the country, and is the author of 11 novels and eight collections of short stories, with more to come, as you will hear. For those of you new to Richard Bausch, I recommend his collection from 2004 called The Stories of Richard Bausch and his novel, Peace. Also be sure to check out his latest works at the online literary magazine, Narrative. He was in the Air Force, played in a rock band, has traveled far and wide, and holds the wisdom of years of experience of teaching the craft of writing. He's a darling to talk to, and I hope you enjoy the interview. Welcome, Richard Bausch. Good to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I'm very excited to talk to you about a couple of your short, well, a short story and a novella that you've had published on narrative in, what was it, the past few months or so? Right. Right. Um, One of them is called Isolation, the first one, which is a short story. And I found it fascinating because it's a story about the pandemic. And before we talk about the story, I'm just curious, how has the pandemic been treating you? I mean, I know it's been hard for everybody, but has it been helpful to your creativity or hindering it? Well, there's a poem I wrote um, from my wife talking about how it is being just her and me and Lila. And the last line of the poem says, now you're asleep with trees outside. Our windows are clamoring with music. We don't have to go anywhere for a time. The rootless wind is in the trees. So many people, others wait in love for you. They know you. We make our way through this unprecedented hour. And here in this night, speaking completely truthfully, confessing without adornment or excuse, I say that selfishly, cannily, even as the terrible new history unfolds all around us, I want each minute of our sheltering days here to last for years. Beautiful. That's the way it felt. Staying at home wasn't a problem. No, I mean, I normally stay at home. Both of us are fairly well home bodies and, you know, on Zoom. Yeah. And, uh, and I, I have had a lot of uh, creative energy, but I don't know. You know, I lost my twin brother in 2018 in October. And I wrote some people a little afterwards that for the first time in my life, writing feels like refuge instead of something I do. It's not an occupation anymore. It's, it's a place to go for shelter in a way from the awfulness of it, you know. Yeah. My clinical twin. Uh, that's, you know, I finished this novel, it's called Playhouse, and sent it off. And in the time it took, they were, you know, it took about three months to hear. I wrote two novellas and, and isolation and I work on another one. Trigger Warnings is one of them too. And they're very different. I mean, Doniolo is, uh, you know, about the guy and his wife with their daughter home from the divorce. And the other novella, I haven't sent it out yet, is called The Broken House. And it's a uh, it's 92 pages, a story about a guy being an altar boy and thinking he might want to be a priest. And he's remembering all this going all the way back. At one point, he says, this seems like a story about my whole life. It isn't, but it involves my whole life. So that's two novellas, isolation, trigger warnings, and then revisions on Playhouse. I'm doing that right now. So you've been very busy with your work. Well, and working all day. Yeah. It's- I used to work, you know, I never was such a hardworking cat. I'd work <laughs> two hours and that would be it, you know? Okay, I put in my two hours. I even put an alarm on. It was more fun playing guitar and messing around. Um, I'm blessed with an ability to do things over and over without getting bored. Your story isolation, and I've read a lot of your short stories. I can't say I've read all of your short stories, but I've read quite a significant amount of them. And isolation was, you have a way of taking 
ordinary people and putting them into extraordinary circumstances. Now, obviously the pandemic was a perfectly made circumstance to be handed to you. The circumstances that you put this this woman in in this story are rather interesting, not something that I would have considered. Can you tell me a little bit, give people a little taste about what the story is about? It's, it's about a woman who, just as the pandemic is breaking on us all, falls in love with the guy she's been working with. And they begin an affair, even though she's in love with her husband. So she's caught in that way between the two. And they, because they're honorable people, they decide they can't keep doing this. They're going to break it up, but it's too hard. And then she begins to suspect he's caught the, the disease. And of course he has. And then the rest of it is that trap and what does she do? How can she do anything? And finally to get the reader to see the extent of it, how deep it goes. And, and so her husband's line at the end when he says, it will end, right? Is something where the reader goes, this isn't going to end. This is going to go on. This is going to be pain for a long time. It's what I do as a writer. I'm, I mean, er, almost everything I've ever done is almost blatantly about love. It's about the complications of love and the ways in which we, I don't want to say fail, because it's not always about our failing it. It's about what faith and the existent, the exigencies of existence do. And we have, we are this, this creature that loves, that carries it. Because we have the imaginations we have, we can bring to bear on our suffering all the days before and all the imagined days to come. I think our pain is far more serious. It's much more pain than just about any other creature because we have that. We have the weight of our awareness of it. Like we're the creature that dies and knows that we die and we know that we know. That's tough. You know, that's a hard thing. And the fact that, oh, forget the pump of sound of this, but the fact that we can be silly and throw laughter at the stars and goof off and delight in things I think is, is the purest evidence that we're way better than the angels. The angels don't have to deal with any of that. We deal with that. We're better. That's the thing I admire most about us as a species. Our ability to love and laugh in spite of the weight that yeah. we carry around. There's a thing I haven't done in the last year or so. We used to do it where after class, we all go out to the bar. And after we come out of the bar after an hour or two, I get us all in a circle. It's called the huddle. Mm -hmm. And everybody had to get really low in the circle and then very slowly stand saying, oh, God, but I do love being gifted and throwing our arms at the sky all in unison. And then everybody goes away and goes home. It sounds like a good way to end the night. The students used to ask for it. Let's do the hell. Come on. <laughs> That's awesome. Your novella. Don Iolo. And by the way, both of these, Isolation and Don Iolo, are both available to read on narrative.com, correct? Yep. Yep. So your novella, Don Iolo, is also your sort of landscape of the family. You know, you talk about the different ways that we love and the way that it can trip us up. And uh, the narrator of this story, I believe his name is Benjamin, yes? Well, he's the character. Hartsford. Central character. Yeah, he's the character. He's not the narrator. Um, but he's he's he, he feels to me like he's caught between his wife and his daughter, and he doesn't quite know who to please. I think there's some of that in there. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about that particular novella and how you came to write it. It started out as a story I was calling Luxury. And it's been in my queue for, hell, I was living in Memphis when I started it. So it's got to be 10, 15 years anyway. I had a very short couple of pages. I decided to throw a party for their daughter to celebrate that she's home and she doesn't want a party. And I had this idea she'd buy them a lot of expensive stuff and it would get, you know, ridiculous. But it, it just stayed there and I didn't think of it. Or, and finally, after I had delivered Playhouse, I thought, well, now I want to do a book of stories. I've got several, you know, that I've done over the last, I'm always writing them. And I only need two or three more to make a collection, which I just delivered, by the way. It is done. Oh, that's exciting. It's called The Fate of Others. So I started on it. You know, let's take him to Florence. Let's take him somewhere. I think I started it with the Venza family had left her a lot of money in there in Italy. And I think, well, they go to Florence. Why don't they go to Florence? And then the moment where he sees his daughter's face in Donatello's Magdalene statue, which I think is the greatest statue in the world. It is breathtaking. I've, I've seen it myself. It's uh, 
something you don't forget easily. No, in fact, it shuts everybody who goes into that room up. You'll see uh, people gathered around it. There's a cross from the 13th century, a kind of a plaster Paris cross, and there's relics and all that stuff in the cabinet. But that spotlight on her in that room, and I mean, everybody that walks in there, people are talking until they get in there, and then it's total silence, almost like they're in the presence of God himself. But anyway, I, the whole thing with the Magdalene came up, and then I thought, you know, there was no time when I consciously decided, well, this is going to be a novella, but it just kept getting more and more complicated. And finally, I looked up, and it was 92 pages, and I thought, what the hell? <laughs> it's done. How do you know it's done? I mean, how do you know something is done? It tells you. It's almost Does it? as if it, Frank O'Connor said, I, I never trust a story until it stands up and tells me to go to hell. <laughs> And okay. I think a little of it is like, it's a little like that. It's like, that's good advice. You sit down and you start to change something. And it's like the story is saying, what, what do you want? You want to change that? It's no different than what you had before. Put the comma back, asshole. You know? <laughs> so there is one. Is that okay to say in the record? Oh, yeah, absolutely. No, okay. curse away. <laughs> in your novella, Don Iolo, you, there's something that I noticed that was sort of a theme of, of, the fear of losing a child, not in the sense of the child dying, but losing the relationship with the child. Mm -hmm. And you use that in another story um, called Fatality. Yeah. Of course, there's two very different outcomes. Can you, do you have any comments on that? Fatality, that was written from reading a marvelous story. Great writer. His son is now a bestselling writer, Debus, Andre Debus. Oh, sure. I think it's called Revenge or something like that. And there's this place where a murder takes place and it takes place off stage and the reader knows what happened. I was working on a story about uh, a father-in-law, a father whose son-in-law is beating up his daughter. And that came from my daughter, Emily, was dating this guy named Adam. She's married to a wonderful, beloved young man named Adam now. I mean, Adam's 50, but I say young man because I'm an old man, but... She was going with this other kid named Adam. We're all watching a movie, and this Adam got up and went like that and walked outside, and Emily got up and followed him out. He was going to go out there and smoke a cigarette. And I went upstairs, and I said to my then wife, I'm 53 years old. I've had a good life. You know, if that son of a bitch does a thing to hurt her, I'll kill him. I'll just kill him. I won't even ask questions. And yeah, I'll spend the rest of my life in prison if I have to. And she's saying, don't say anything. You'll drive her right into his arms. She's smart. She'll take care of it. And she was right. You know, she did. She jettisoned that guy right quick. But anyway, I started thinking, what if the guy doesn't? What if she does marry him and the guy's stuck? And tries, I found out that the law effectively makes chattel out of a wife. Just does. A stranger walking down the street can see a man beating up his wife in the living room and can't report it. It's not a valid report. The wife has to report it. And uh, the, the pattern is the wife reports it. The guy's back home in an hour on bail and the retribution commences immediately. I had this guy in this trap and then I read Deboos's great story and I thought, yeah, he'll kill him. Why not? Yes, I just said I'd do that. You know, a month ago I said I'd do that if that guy... Emily was dating, but it's going to happen on stage. So I said, I'm, what I'm going to do is make it, bring the reader to the point of wanting it to happen and then have the reader see the horror of what it really is, a murder. And so I wrote it. It took me about I don't know, six weeks. It's it's the kind of center center panel of Gil Bordos's wonderful movie, A Specimen Essay, and the scene where he kills him is just brilliant. Just brilliant. Let's talk a little bit about the craft of writing and about your personal history of writing. Tell me a little bit about how you got into writing. Have you always been writing? And tell me a little bit about the relationship between you and your brother. And because he was a writer too. I mean, he wrote a lot of novels. In fact, I work at a library and I can go to my our bookshelves in the B section and see you and your brother's books side by side. It's yeah. pretty amazing. Well, he wrote Almighty Me, which, which became Bruce Almighty. Right, they right. Paid him, but uh, I mean, they paid him a lot of money for the rights to option it. Yeah, mm. but then when it was made, they didn't give him another penny. They they squirmed out of it. Mm. The two guys that wrote it moved to another studio, and then they they, they didn't have to keep the contract. And Bobby sued him the same with 
the same guy who sued for Art Buchwald, Eddie Murphy, successfully over a steal like that. Hmm. But they started their deep pockets and they kept, you know, continuance and continuance. And finally, the guy said, I can't do it on spec anymore. I'm going to have to start charging you. And Bobby said, the hell with him on something else. Yeah. But uh, but you yourself, how did you start writing? I was 17 and I was reading poems. I, I had been very devout as a planning on the priesthood when I was 16. And I was had a, oh, really? a lot of prayers memorized and stuff. And I would go around mm-hmm. studying the prayers. And I think in retrospect, I know what I was in love with more than what was in the prayers was the words. The poetry of it? Yeah. So I started reading poetry. I had a book. I still have it. It's not the same copy but it's but it's in fact it's not the actual copy but it's the same edition and the same paperback the treasure golden treasury of poetry and mm. got a little bit about each poet uh, and I was reading Whitman and I started imitating Whitman I, I felt larcenous and like I was cheating but what I was actually doing was unwittingly teaching myself to write you learn by imitating you know I had read that Jack Kennedy read War and Peace and so I read War and Peace thinking that maybe I'd go into politics when I was 17 and 18. And then Dylan came along, and I remember standing in a upstairs of Montgomery Wards with all these records looking at uh, Odetta, an album of Odetta with the words to Mr. Tambourine Man on the back and marveling at how those rhymes came so far apart and so well done. Mm-hmm. The thing where he says, it's just a shadow you're seeing that he's chasing. Um, and But for that, there are no fences facing and it's separated by, you know, three rhymes in between. That. I just was so impressed with all that. I mean, I'm still impressed by some of Dylan's little tricks with, with rhymes, you know. He looks so truthful. Is this how he feels trying to peel the moon and expose it? With his business-like anger and his bloodhounds that kneel, if he needs a third eye, he just grows it. He just needs you to talk or to hand him his chalk or pick it up after he throws it. And I'm going, damn, that's cool. You know, I don't even care what it says. <laughs> of course, I played a lot of Dylan, so. You play guitar, yes. Yeah. Well, I learned that, started learning when I was 24. I'm okay. much better than I was then, but I still play. All of that sort of, and I remember saying uh, 1970, things hadn't worked out with singing. I mean, I started out, I was going to go be a singer-songwriter, and I remember... What was the name of your band? The Loved Ones was one. That was all girls. Really? Yeah, except for me. And, except for you. And the other one was, and I wasn't by any means, I was a, a, a glorified roadie. I would sing a couple of songs and drive a car. I, I could do Dylan, and so I would do like a Rolling Stone while they played. And, but I, I wrote a couple of lyrics for him, and, and uh, a friend of mine named Dave Marmerstein and I started to perform and write songs. But by 1970, I remember saying, I'm going to write stories. And, and I'm tired of trying to figure out what else to do in the key of G. <laughs> Do you think that music was limiting you? No, I was the one who was limited. I love it all. I mean, I have I have what you'd call eclectic taste in it from all ages. I know and can sing most of Sinatra's catalog. There are songs back there in the emotional range of that period. There's a song called It Gets Lonely Early. It's one of them. Oh, God, what a beautiful song that is. And you should hear Dylan do it. Dylan's released two albums or three now from the great songbook. And does he ever sing them? He does such a job singing them. But anyway, then it just sort of fell into, you know, I was writing poems and I was sending them off, expecting there to be four executives from the Atlantic Monthly on the porch when I got back home. <laughs> I was painting houses, you know. Isn't that everybody's dream? <laughs> yeah. But as I posted on Facebook this morning, uh, where my friend Maria Browning's site from Chapter 16 in Nashville, I, you know, I used to tell my students I could paper my wallpaper, my walls with rejection slips. And uh, in fact, I did put a bunch up on the wall in my office at school when I was teaching at Mason. And I had this thing or a big briefcase full of failed manuscripts, you know, four novels, three of them typescripts and one of them a thick you know, sheaf of longhand legal pad. And I would walk in and say, ladies and gentlemen, and dramatically open the case and start taking them out and putting them down to pass around. Allow me to show you the face of failure. And I did it to encourage them to say, well, yeah, it's okay to get it wrong. But a couple of them came to see me finally one day and said, could you stop doing it? Could you not do that? It's so (laughs) goddamn depressing. Don't do it. Take the fucking rejections off the wall. We did 
Oh, I don't know. I think it's, it's very important to hear somebody who's had success as a writer, see all of their rejections and know that they kept going in the face of that. I think that's incredibly powerful to see. Yeah, they they didn't find it that way. Well, okay. <laughs> but, I do. It, it's, it's the condition of this life. I don't know one writer who hasn't had dozens of rejections. That's just the way it is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. So do you have, obviously, you, you write quite a bit at home. I'm sure that's, is, is that where, because you said you were a homebody earlier. So do you have a personal writing space in your house? Do you have like an office or a, yeah, I'm in, a I'm writing in, room? I'm in my shed. Your shed. Okay. Is that yeah. detached from the house or? Yeah. Okay. So you got some bookcases, some photographs. That's Elvis Presley and uh, B.B. King up there. Oh, okay. And that's the letter from my editor at Knopf about peace. And that's the poster from the movie that became Recon. Can you see all that? Yeah. So you have a separate building that you write in. And do you have any rituals that you, you do when you sit down to get going? I mean, do you read? I know a lot of people read before they write. Some people um, do other stuff. I have a I have a cowbell that I actually ring that is on the wall. And I ring that when I to say, this is it. I'm going to start writing. That's cool. Um, yeah. But I think I did see it on Facebook. You posted a picture of your dad. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Tell me about that. And I sit down and say hi, dad. And start. What is the picture of? Can you describe it? It's in, he's in the war. He and some other soldiers are looking towards you in the sunlight with smiles on their faces. 1943. And where was he stationed? Italy. He was okay. In the casino. Much like your novel, Peace. Yeah. In fact, um, the bones of Peace, the, the central spine of it, is a story I heard him tell about this old guy guiding them up over this steep hill and coming across a dead German soldier with a bullet right in the middle of his forehead and going away wow. to see and coming back down. And then his commanding officer telling him to take the old man out in the woods and shoot him. My father would tell how he took the guy down there and said, Via, go, and fired a shot into the dirt. The guy was too scared to run. And, and the, thing oh my that, God. the thing that sank down into me, when I know I'm gonna write about something, it's, a, it's like a stone dropped into the inner pond. And the ripples start, and I know at some point I'm going to write about it, uh, was the first time I heard him tell the story. He said the poor old bastard was so scared he pissed himself. Mm -hmm. And they all stood there as this steaming urination is on the you know, ground around his foot, and the guy's praying, and my father realized, my father was a devout Catholic, that he was saying the Hail Mary in Italian. And, uh, and then the guy tells him to go shoot him. So dad took him down and said, Via. And he, he told it as a kind of a funny thing because he said, and I'm pretty soon I'm pissed at him and I'm going, Via, God damn you, Via, go, go. And he said, I came this close to shooting him because he wouldn't run. And then he would laugh and say, he finally took off. So I wrote a story about it, a short story and showed um, no, he said, it's, I, I disagree. And I thought that was funny because it sounded like the story was a proposal or something. And he said, it wasn't like that. He says, uh, look, I had an, I was ordered. I was disobeying an order. I felt that bad. He said, um, and you know, only the day before we overturned a cart looking for contraband and a crowd officer and a whore fell out. And uh, he says, you Which know, falls right them. out of your novel. He said, we took them away. But I'm lying there one night. I just finished a long story that I love. I still love called The Harp Department in Love. It's the first story and something is out. I just finished work on it and I realized that only 21 thin little <laughs> window pane was separating me from 24 degrees and I was freezing. And I went through that little house and got into bed, staying far to the left of Lisa so I wouldn't wake her up with my cold feet and <laughs> lay there nice shivering and trying to think. <laughs> and lay there shivering, thinking, well, you know, it's been 11 years since dad died. Thinking about it was, you know, it was it was in June, but we were coming. It was the end of February. We we're coming up on his birthday, March 15th. And then I started, I thought of that past where he didn't like that story. I didn't even know what I ever did to the story. And then I thought, suddenly it just hit me that I could do it. That I'm a novelist. It doesn't have to. And at the time... I think probably the word that would have come would have been a short story writer because I didn't think it would be anything but a short story. But I don't have to hold myself to the facts. I can make it up. And so I went, got up, got back up, put a bathrobe. No, put a winter coat on and went back to that chair um, on the other side of the house and started peace. And the opening section of it is on the opening chapter. Chapter one is almost word for word what the draft. And here's an interesting thing. Um, the guy shoots her. Glick shoots the woman. Now I'm making it up. 
And I went on pass because I'm concentrating on getting to where they go and come back. And we get that pass where he's ordered to kill the old man. And I'm about eight pages past that. And I went, wait a minute, that's a murder. I can't just leave that. I, can't, I just can't, I can't go by that. That's, I got to deal with that. And what I had unwittingly done is set what would truly be the point of the novel is that in the middle of all this profligate violence, a murder takes place. How does that happen? How is there a murder in the middle of all that killing? And it isn't a question that is intellectually asked, but it's there and it troubles all of them. They think they're cursed because of it. And then at the end, it surprised me that he finds out Glick was killed. There's nothing to do about any of it now. The war had got Glick. Who do you tell now? You know? And then the whole business about the sniper and doubling back to shooting, that's all made up. That's that's the novelist in me, you know? Yeah. That one came quick. I started it on February 26th and was done by May 8th. Oh, wow. That is quick. Yeah, I went to Chattanooga for the Fellowship of Southern Writers. And my dear friend, Bobby Ann Mason, said to me, so are you coming to the party? I said, no, I'm going up in my room. And right. She laughed because we all joke about it. Nah, you're not going to write. I said, <laughs> no, I'm working on a novel set in the terrible winter of 1944 in Casino, and the novel's called Peace. And she said, I can't wait to see it. And I went upstairs and went on back to work on it. That's important, having pals that are trying to do the same thing and know exactly what it is, you know. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's hard to, because as a writer, writer writing is such a solitary endeavor, and yet you have to have friends who understand that endeavor and can commiserate with you that's yeah most of you know how's it going today i remember andrea barrett saying to me i don't know whether to throw this thing away or take a huge xanax and go to sleep <laughs> i said come on you got here this far you know you can do this she's a hell of a writer but we don't feel that way isn't that interesting i mean people talk about it today as being imposter syndrome and we all feel like we're just a big fraud and I find that so fascinating because I thought I was the only one who felt that way, but apparently everybody has moments. My friend Charlie Baxter said to me one day, we we're sitting there sipping whiskey. This is in 1985 or six. And I said, I was having trouble. Well, I'll tell you, it was even earlier than that because I was having trouble with my third novel. And I said, uh, man, I said, I, I don't know. Every morning he, he looked at me and sipped the whiskey and he used the glass to indicate the door. And he said, every time that doorbell rings, I think it's the fraud police. <laughs> oh boy yeah yeah it's, it's normal it's normal. in fact the people that i meet in traveling in the academy who are um now of course there are exceptions but but who are completely sure of their genius are the ones with the least amount of talent they'll show you a line so bad it's funny and say isn't this brilliant Jack Edmondson's eyes skyrocketed shut. what an image and i go well yeah that's not really an image so much it's <laughs> unwittingly hilarious <laughs> so you 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 got an MFA, correct? Mm -hmm. And you got it from the University of Iowa, I believe. I worked. My classmates were Alan Berganis and Jane Smiley and Richard Wiley. Wow. Grossman, Joanne. What a cohort! I'm sorry. Who were the last two? Joanne Macheri and Barbara Grossman, who ended up being a senior publisher at I want to say Little Brown. She brought Annie Prue to the world. Wow. And Barbara's a hell of a writer, but she'd rather, rather be an editor. Hmm. And of course, Jane is Jane. <laughs> Incredible. You know, I'm in her novel, Moo. I did not know that. She has me uh, with my silken Virginia accent telling her young character, never tell him the size of your advance. <laughs> <laughs> She's great. And but you've you've taught a lot. I mean, you've been teaching for many, many years at different universities. And right now you're at... Chapman University out in California, correct? Yep. They, and they're grownups, I tell you. Oh, yeah. This semester, there was a mix up in scheduling classes, and my um, advanced fiction workshop didn't make. There were only four people registered for it because the other students who would have had to go to this required class. Oh. So my beloved department chair says, well, why don't you just take the spring off with pay? You just, uh, you've earned enough hours doing theses to take the spring off. So this spring, I'm, I haven't had to do Zoom. I haven't had to teach at all. I've done a couple of theses, which is sort of always going to be something you do. But, you know, that's, a, that's four days work. The rest of the time, I've been writing and um, enjoying things. Although that I sounds teaching. great. I love teaching. Teaching. I get, I get energy from teaching. I love it. I mean, I, you know, I remember talking to Alan Shapiro, wonderful poet, funny guy. And we were talking about it. And I said, 
are you ever going to retire? I mean, I don't think I'm ever going to retire. And he goes, oh, no, no. He says, no, I'm never going to be retired. I'll be soiling myself at the front of the room. (laughs) That sounds like something my father would say. So let's talk a little bit about writing and Hollywood, because you have had several of your pieces uh, turned into film. Uh, Can you tell me a little bit about what they are and uh, how that came to be? I mean, I think it's every writer's dream to see their, their work appear on the big screen and just how to tell me a little bit about the mechanics of how that happens and what it was like just to see your work appear like that well it's it's it act, it's actually different in almost a, different in almost every instance i mean the uh, it happens sometimes um rather quickly and sometimes like with a specimen i say that happened fast i mean the option did in april and paid for it in june and shot it and it was amazing how quick that was and you should have seen me in the kitchen saying to lisa the guy that made renoir is going to do this but you know, The Last Good Time was the first one, my novel, The Last Good Time. Bob Balaban made that into a film. And that had been optioned every year from when it was published, 1984, to when it was finally shot in 1994 and released in 1995. And four different people had options on it. At okay. one point, there were two people who optioned it and asked me to make a play out of it. And I actually took a stab at it and uh, got this phone call where the guy goes, Richard, it stinks. <laughs> Oh, I can still be. Wow. I said, oh, well, he says, we think you can do more. I said, well, I, I you know, actually, I'm a novelist. I don't want to write this. I'm not a playwright. Get a playwright to do it. And that sort of, then Bob Balaban came in and said he wanted to make a film out of it. And we went with Bob and Bob got it made. Um, with Armin Mullerstahl, whom I have great respect for, a um, terrific German actor who came over from East Germany, has been in many, and he's got to be 80s now. He was 64 then. They got that made and um, was released in 95. I never had any, you know, he wrote me a couple of times and sent me a page of the script and asked me to comment on it or to mess with it a little bit. It was always, for me, it was fine. I didn't see anything, you know, that I should do. I would just say, look, it looks good. He got this guy to write a script, finally, who really didn't get the heart of the book and wrote a whole thing about him being accused of not paying his taxes and stuff in there that kind of distracts. I love it that the critics said the only bad thing about the movie is this subplot about the taxes. <laughs> because that wasn't yours. <laughs> no, okay. But um, well, I went on that set and he, Balaban was so sweet. He came out and said, oh, you're here. The press kit's here. You can be interviewed about having this done. And he introduced me to this lovely young woman, dark hair, intense looking, but really, really one of those, you know, faces where you go, my God, just strikingly beautiful. And she walked up to me and said, I want you to know that I love, love, love your work. And I said, good, thank you. I didn't know what to do with my (laughs) face, you know. I mean, I had my son and daughter there. And uh, she said, I just want you to know that you are responsible for the first existential thoughts I ever had in the fifth grade. And I realized that she thought I was Richard Bach and had written Jonathan Livingston Seagull. (laughs) Oh, dear. (laughs) So I was Richard Bach for 20 minutes. I didn't want to embarrass her. No. (laughs) Anyway, that that was, I figured, the last time, you know, there would be anything. Um, and then nothing happened until there were options each time. There was an option on violence. That every single one of them has had an option. Bell Star, the option, has been around now for almost 15 years. And, and that one's finally possibly getting made? Possibly. Who knows? I mean, they kind of sent me a lot of money for a, a purchase price, what they called the, uh, the, pri- the, the amount before operating budget. I would get a percentage of whatever the operating budget was going to be, too. And uh, it's been more than a year. I haven't heard a thing. A fine screenwriter named Julie Lipson wrote the script, which I very much admired. Um, she took off with it. I thought it was very good. But then um, uh, and there were several short films that made from short stories. Yeah, I think I've seen that on IMDb. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, one that was in this Los Angeles short film festival of my story, Wedlock, really did a hell of a job, but I've not been able to find it anywhere since. Hmm. Anyway, then very quickly, uh, April of 17, I guess it was, it comes up that, that Gilles Bordeaux is optioning 
six of my stories. Are they still my stories? And I wrote, yes, they are to my agent. And my agent said, as it went on, yeah, he gave the permission and everything. My agent said, uh, you ought to talk to the guy. He's really a neat guy. I've spoken to him a couple of times. He's a good guy. You might like him. And so I emailed him one night and we ended up joke emailing back and forth for about two hours about different films we like. And since then he's become, he's, I love the guy. He's like a brother. Same with Robert Port. They became, I mean, uh, I say this in all seriousness, the movies, those two movies are wonderful to have, but the most important thing for me about them is they brought me these two dear friends. So whether they got made or not, you know, if we were all dentists, we'd still be good friends, as Susan Shreve used to say when I'm, you know, working with her at George Mason. But thank God you're not dentists. <laughs> yes, I'd go crazy looking in people's mouths. <laughs> Can you tell me, I mean, we talked a little bit about your brother passing in 2018, and you talked about how that plus the pandemic has sort of given you a, uh, I don't know, a, a not, not necessarily a spurt, but maybe a collection of creativity that has fueled all of this new writing that you've been doing. Can you tell me a little bit about how grief affected your creativity, I guess, is the question. I think it's more of an eruption of a kind because, uh, I don't know, it's brought my own mortality much more to the front. So I don't really, part of it is I don't really feel like I have any time to waste. I want to get everything said that's in me to say, even though I don't know what it is until I've said it. I think it's partly that, um, that as my now gone brother-in-law Skip said to me once, that stuff gets your attention. You know, there's so many hours in a day that you think, well, I'll do that tomorrow. But now it just seems real important to get it done. I mean, when I get through with this last provision of Playhouse, I'll have two books getting waiting to, to come out. Let's talk a little bit about, I asked you to pick a favorite short story that has impacted your writing or has influenced you in some particular way. And you chose, why don't you tell me what you chose? I chose uh, Anton Chekhov's Gusev. And tell me a little bit about that story. It's a story of a, uh, a man in a hole of a ship uh, with a, uh, other men, and they're on their way home, the motherland, and all of them are sick. All of them have consumption. And he centers on this one guy, Gusev. He, you get Gusev's personal memories. He's waiting for, he can't wait to get home and see his brother. And he has a dream that his brother is coming out to greet him in the sleigh. And so are his little niece and nephew. And his brother's had a drop. And all of a sudden it's replaced by a, an eyeless bull over a lake that he can't explain. But you're in his mind. And the people around him are disputating and this is a death ship we're all going to die and one of them says does the wind have chains and the other one corrects him and says you have no sense the wind can't have chains you know and he calls him on somebody using personification in that way that the wind has chains or and the thing that's amazing about it one of the Chekhov is going to use that very tack at the end of the story because what happens is Gusev sees uh, witnesses that they take one person, one of them out who's died. And he has a conversation with the other and lies down and says he goes to sleep. And Chekhov doesn't even say that he died. He says he slept for two days. And two men came in and picked him up and took him up on the ship and wrapped up on the deck and wrapped him in sailcloth and dropped him plop into the sea. And then the last paragraph of that story, I want you to hear it. He plunges rapidly downward. Will he reach the bottom? Now, this is somebody whose mind and dreams we have been in. At this spot, the ocean is said to be three miles deep. After sinking 60 or 70 feet, he begins to descend more and more slowly, swaying rhythmically as though in hesitation and carried along by the current, moves faster laterally than vertically. And now he runs into a school of fish called pilot fish. Seeing the dark body, the little fish stop as though petrified and suddenly all turn around together and disappear. In less than a minute, they rush back to Gusev, swift as arrows, and begin zigzagging around him in the water. Then another dark body appears. It is a shark. Now here's what he's doing. He's backing away like this, almost as if he's a camera. He says, with dignity and reluctance, seeming not to notice... Gusev, as it were, it swims under him. Then while he, moving downward, sinks upon its back, the shark turns, belly upward, basks in the warm, transparent water, and languidly opens its jaws with two rows of teeth. The pilot fish are in ecstasy. Listen to the personification as we move on. They stop to see what will happen next. After playing a little with the body, the shark nonchalantly puts his jaws under it, cautiously touches it with his teeth, 
and the sailcloth is ripped the full length of the body from head to foot. One of the gridirons falls out, frightens the pilot fish, and striking the shark on the flank, sinks rapidly to the bottom. Meanwhile, up above, in that part of the sky where the sun is about to set, clouds are massing, one resembling a triumphal arc, another a lion, a third a pair of scissors, a broad shaft of green light issues from the clouds and reaches to the middle of the sky. A while later, a violet beam appears alongside of it and then a golden one and a pink one. The heavens turn a soft lilac tint. Looking at this magnificent enchanting sky, the ocean frowns at first, but soon it too takes on tender, joyous, passionate colors for which it is hard to find a name in the language of man. And that is very great writing indeed. I mean, it just, it actually, you, you see it as the death, this one man alone among strangers in the hold of a ship, but it gives his death a dignity, maybe even a kind of majesty in the face of it all. But it also confronts us with <laughs> a perception we don't want. You know what I mean? I mean, we don't want to think about it. That's why I love Chekhov. Hmm. There are passages in Chekhov where you just, you know, there's one called In the Ravine where a woman is going through a village with her dead infant in her arms, walking around, and you just, you know, you're going, oh, my God. And yet he's, by turns, hilarious. There's one called the Pechenyeg where a traveler comes and stays in the village house of this man the village calls the Pechenyeg who complains to him about his wife, and he gets something of the story of his unhappy household and the guest goes to sleep, and in the morning, it's such a Chekhovian moment. As the traveler gets on a coach to pull away, he yells back, you have bored me nearly to death. <laughs> <laughs> and how has, yeah, tell me, tell me how, how Chekhov has influenced your writing. Oh, I think just uh, to not be afraid of being directly indirect, if that makes any sense, of laying things in there in revision that, you know, an attentive reader may pick up, but at least will be affected by it um, in a way that what you want, and this is from Pasternak, really, I love the Russians, it's, it's, you want the reader to comprehend something without quite knowing why or how, or even quite able to express it except in terms of the story. You know, when, when people say to me, what are you trying to say? I say, I'm trying to say that. That's what I'm trying to say, that. The story, that's it there. Uh, I don't, it's not a code. I don't have any, um, I don't have any conscious message. The conscious messages are kind of dull, finally. We all know unkindness sucks. We all know it's cruelty, isn't it? There's no place for cruelty. We all know that the world can be a savage, unforgiving place. All of that. But it's the particulars. That's what John Updike said. Love resides in the particulars. So what our job as writers is, is to provide with as much faith as we can to the truthfulness of the experience, the particulars, and let the rest fall where it will. I have been reading your Facebook ruminations. You post them quite often, and I love reading them. I, whenever I see one in my feed, I'm like, oh boy, I get, another, I get another gem. There was one particular line that you wrote when you were talking about just this, letting go and not putting so much pressure on your characters to create meaning in your story. You said, forget what you think you think and what you suppose you know. Yeah, it's true. In fact, I never really trust a story unless it surprises me. James Dickey once said, uh, I could see him saying it, Plato called it seizure, he said, you know, and that's when you come upon something that you had no notion that you knew. Then he goes, no wonder writers sell their grandmothers down a river and cheat one way or another. Once having had that, you know, there can never be anything so important. And he's talking about that surprise where you didn't know you knew something and you think, and you know, I promise you this, and this is what I love to tell students, when you come to a place like that in a story, by some writer, whoever it is. And you have that moment of that shock of recognition, like, God, I've always known that. I've never had it expressed quite that way. I guarantee you the writer, him or herself, was just as surprised getting to that moment as you are. That's why reading is such an intimate experience. It's a connection between souls. You know, that connection is holy. And it's also indestructible. It's never going to go away. Yeah, you talk about those little moments that resonate with you. And I think that that's the key right there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Marvelous. Can I listen to you read from Trigger Warnings? Yeah. Or read Trigger Warnings? Yes, this is uh this is gonna be in the collection. It's also gonna be in narrative. 
They haven't given. Oh, excellent. Haven't given me a Super. closing date yet, but you'll you'll get right quick what's going on here. Okay. Okay. Tr- okay. Trigger warnings. Contains vulgarly expressed suspicions of adultery by two major characters: protagonist Thomas Briley's wife Constance, with protagonist's nephew, younger by seven years. Occurring after wife indicates with lascivious insinuations, believing might be pregnant by someone else, and then names Kirk. Purported adultery described by her in lurid detail as she claims, also in crude terms, her intentions to go move in with Kirk, whose roommate Ellen, living together out of wedlock, has moved back into her mother's mansion. Trivializing references to Catholicism and blood of Spanish Inquisition by protagonist in relation to wife's hypocrisy about religion as against her attitude about Kirk, a lapsed former priest. One scene encompasses general disrespect of priests with remark by protagonists recalling Chaucer's poem about man in hell asking where priests are and seeing suddenly thousands of priests flying like moths out of the important nether part of devil's digestive anatomy. Also includes upsetting scene of wife Constance donning tights for ride on recently purchased most space exercise bike as protagonist asks in rawest language if she and nephew Kirk are involved. Description of her gaze at protagonist contains allusion to her supposed infidelity as she turns away, pulling down tights to show indecent part of her lower body and says, take a guess, adding offensive epithet, naming him as cavity of aforesaid part human digestive anatomy. Followed by protagonist's abusive reaction, suggesting she depart to perform sexual act on herself, adding stream of anti-female tropes, also violent removal of most space exercise bike through apartment picture window. Depiction of exercise bike and shattered glass hitting passerby on street. Graphic image of injury involving blood result of most space exercise bike. Injured party berated by protagonists regarding weight and size, too heavy and slow to evade falling exercise bike. Several crude terms for obesity, fantasies of physical violence between protagonists and others, between Constance and Ellen's mother Gladys, portrayed in coarse terms as a wealthy crone with a filthy mouth, homosexual tendencies, several quotes from her containing scatological language and racial slurs, who chain smokes and has an insane amount of money protagonist describes as exiting the now thrice mentioned part of digestive anatomy. Examples in Gladys's sequences of lewd talk and suggestions of homosexual behavior from protagonist and Constance both. Many instances of prevarication and deception, including elaborate obscene fantastical lies told to protagonist by wife to hurt him. Several discussions, ride is a venery. All characters engage in such talk at party scene near close of story. In that scene, several inappropriate jokes, puns, asides with smutty overtones, detailed descriptions of alcohol abuse, use of marijuana and other substances, smoking present in almost every scene, nudity depicted in scene, brimming with inappropriate remarks about other races and cultures between protagonist and wife at exotic hotel in Morocco, Two instances, smoking depictions of se- after depictions of sexual behavior during depicted journey to rekindle romantic feelings to make up for neglect by both parties, vows of marriage. Several instances, lascivious and destructive imaginings and dream sequences that include setting fire to mansion after shooting and maiming a family member, the nephew Kirk. References to and portrayals of hypocrisy, moral sloth, venery, even after protagonist and wife reconcile an explicit scene following confession of lying about betrayal to get protagonists' attention. Stories suggest in obscene terms, protagonists' lack of awareness that troubles have arisen from immense self-absorption, materialism, greed, alcohol excess throughout, many references to acrobatic sexual behavior, exotic methods, contraception, several alleged aphrodisiac, same-sex normalization, manipulation of daily outlooks, facts, history, finance. Disparaging statements about certain mental disorders, including paranoia, the protagonist, hypochondria, Gladys, Ellen, Kirk, Constance, and anxiety, all. Contains nakedly expressed conviction by protagonist that his suffering added up to nothing. During protagonist's attempt at redemption, visiting injured party in hospital room day after most most space exercise bike episode, illicit drugs, sexually explicit tropes present, deplorable air of waste and excess throughout, 
depicted failures overall regarding fidelity, duty, responsibility, morality, cleanliness, cleanliness, order. Couples reunion has sour ruminations further disrespecting religion. Abortion mentioned four times. That's called trigger warnings. <laughs> and I had a, a lot of fun writing it too. I can tell, yes. I uh, I had a very hard time not laughing during that. I mean, I can hardly wait to see that in print mm-hmm. so I can ruminate a little bit on it. <laughs> Thank you so much for getting together with me today and talking to me. It's been absolutely delightful. I think you are a national treasure. Oh, thank you. That's a very sweet thing to say. <laughs> well, I'm enchanted. Oh, well, you're, in, I find you pretty enchanting, kiddo. Those are oh, very thank you. questions. And, um, Thanks. Well, um, I'm going made a to. a wonderful new friend. Yeah, I think that's awesome. Stay close. That will wrap up this month's episode of First Person Interviews with Authors. Next time we pop up in your feed, you'll be listening to your regular every other week segment where hosts Christine Gill and JC Bronsted deconstruct a short story looking for the elements that make it successful. I'll be back next month with another author interview. If you like our podcasts, please consider leaving us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts. It will help other writers and literary types find us. Thanks for listening and keep writing.